So welcome to Sex Now survey under the lens of the investigators. Uh, the investigators are a project of the Community Based Research Center, and I'll invite Darren Ho to come and uh, describe the program. Hi everyone. Okay, so I'm Darren, and I'm one of the investigators. And just a bit later on, you'll hear um, you have the pleasure of meeting my fellow investigators as they present to you some fascinating research analysis that they've been working on over the past couple of months. First, however, I'm going to give you a brief overview of what the investigators program is and what we do as a team and what we hope to accomplish. So the investigators, like Olivier said, is an initiative of the community-based research center that aims to build the capacities of young gay men in research. The purpose of this training program is to equip young gay men, like ourselves, with skills and resources to contribute to the development of knowledge about gay men's health and gay communities. We formed in January 2011, where a small group of four of us uh, began to work with experienced researchers, uh, Terry Tressler, Rick Marchand, and Olivier himself. And we were using hands-on approaches to learn how to carry out research in a meaningful way. When this program started in 2011, a small group of four of us were recruited and asked to participate in this learning experience. We came into this program as a group with little to no prior knowledge of what statistics and data and research was all about. Uh, I, personally, I personally had never heard of the term odds ratio before, and I thought that chi-squared was pronounced chi-squared. So our, our weekly meetings initially consisted of the experienced researchers bringing in charts and tables from previous sex now surveys, and we would go through them table by table to learn how to read them and know what the information that we were looking at was all about. Very early on in the program, I think before we even came up with the name investigators for ourselves, we were tasked with having very key roles in the production and execution of the SexNow 2011 survey. SexNow survey, sorry. Uh, I'm sure most of you know that the SexNow survey is known to be the largest health survey of gay men in Canada. As a team, we, the investigators, with guidance from our experienced research mentors, were responsible for designing the survey, which meant creating questions, making sure it was thorough yet accessible. Uh, we spent many meetings going over what questions we wanted to ask and what questions could give us the most insight into the social determinants of gay men's health. We also spent a lot of time deciding how we could present the survey in a way that was engaging for, to the people who would have to complete this really, really long survey. We went through many drafts of the survey and hosted some focus groups to get some feedback uh, before finally launching the SexNow 2011 survey online nationwide in September of 2011. So our next challenge and what uh, became a big component of the weekly investigators meeting was to do outreach and recruit participants to do the survey. We each took on different regions of Canada and began connecting with different gay groups, organizations, gay sports teams, gay clubs and bars and subcommittees and other various gay networks within these regions to reach as many gay men in Canada as possible. We also worked on advertising our survey through online sites and social media, and we had investigators do outreach in French for our French-speaking communities in Canada. In the end, we were really happy that we were successful in recruiting a record of 8,607 participants who completed the survey, with every province and territory, territory in Canada being represented. So now that we've gathered so much data to work with, you'll soon be able to hear about some of our interesting findings from my co-investigators in just a bit. But how do we learn to analyze this data if most of us came from backgrounds not related to data and statistics? Well, learning how to analyze data has been an ongoing component of the investigators program. We spent one Sunday participating in an intensive stats boot camp which was a workshop in which we learned the basics of the Stats Analyzing Program, SPSS, uh, with guidance from Craig Phillips of the CBRC board. In addition to all the Sex Now survey work we've been doing, we also spent our meetings learning about what other research initiatives and health-related studies are happening in our community. 
Every so often, we would have guest researchers come to our meetings to share with us their insight on their studies related to the social determinants of gay men's health. Also, we've attended conferences such as the Spring Learning Institute on Sectionality, Intersectionality <laughs> in Mission. These learning through other community members component of the program really help to make the investigators initiative an authentic learning experience. When this program started, a goal was to provide young gay men with the platform to be involved in community research efforts. The intent was, and continues to be, to give young gay men what's necessary to become leaders in youth projects and for us to produce evidence-based resources for gay health. With that said, for the past months we've been doing as our name suggests and have been investigating using the data of the 2011 Sex Now survey. As you can see here, this is our website where you can find out more information about this program or how to get involved. It's cbrc.net. Um, and there you have a brief overview of the investigators program. Thank you. Now I would like to invite investigators uh, Trevor Hudges. Um, well, obviously, um, it wasn't girls who answered the survey. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Alrighty, well, the survey was conducted online, not just in BC, but nationwide in all of Canada. Our top five provinces that got the most recruits for the survey is Ontario at 40%, or 3,367. 3, 3, uh, BC at 21% or 1,805, Alberta at 13% or 1,065, Quebec at almost 13% or 1,048, and Man Manitoba at 4% or 342. Perhaps this is because of the amount of big cities. And our total amount of recruits for the survey is 8,494, which is way up from our previous 2010 survey which we had at 7,910 recruits. The survey was offered in both official language and 91% did it in English, while 9% did it in French. While the majority that took the survey are Caucasian, there is also a representation of many men of diverse ethnicities, as you can see in the slide here. The majority of men, about 50% in the study, are between 40 to 59 with young gay men coming in second at about 20%, who are between 19 to 29. Over 80% of our recruits have a college or university education. What is interesting though, even with an older sample, about 50% of men are making less than 50K despite being really well educated. 65% have self-reported themselves as gay, and 32% self-reported themselves as bi, 2% self-reported as straight, and 1% reported as other for the sexual orientation. While close to 45% of the men in our survey are single, we had 15% 15 of the men married to a woman or over 5% partnered with a woman and 5% that are separated or divorced from a woman, which is quite interesting. While a greater percentage of men are negative, it is very concerning to see that 23% have never tested. Thank you. Thank you, Trevor. Now we will hear from investigator Jaden Starr. Thanks, Olivier. So gender nonconformity. This is important to me because I identify as femme, and so I decided to bring this into my research. And so let's start off with a definition of gender nonconformity. So our definition is when a man's clothes, presentation, expressions, intonation, these things don't meet up to society's ideas of what a man is supposed to look like, act like, speak like. We have some words in our gay, bi, trans, and queer communities for gender non-conforming men. Some of these are sometimes used in derogatory ways, even in our communities. These words include feminine, femme, queen, sissy, nelly, swishy. Let's keep this in mind throughout our presentation. There's also words for gender-conforming men, such as masculine, macho, jock, straight acting, and these have different connotations, often not that negative connotation or used in an insulting way. I decided to put my focus onto fingernails. So let's talk about fingernails. In our sex now survey, we asked a question of if men have ever worn nail polish to work as a signal of their sexuality. My hypothesis 
is that men who demonstrate visible gender nonconformity experience more violence and workplace discrimination than men who are gender non than men who are gender conforming because of uh, oppression based on gender and gender expression. Let's take a look at some of our data from the Sex Now survey. So we have pink and blue colored bar graphs to represent uh, the coding of gender in Western society. Pink for girly and feminine, blue for masculine. And so the pink bars are for the guys who have worn nail polish to work, and the blue is for the bars. The blue is for the men who have not worn nail polish to work. So in terms of experiences of verbal violence, we see 71% of men who have worn nail polish to work having experienced verbal violence, compared to 46% of men who have not experienced, who have not worn nail polish to work. In terms of physical violence, we also see a significant gap of 30% for men who have worn nail polish to work and 12% for guys who have not. And finally, in terms of workplace discrimination, we see 34% of guys who have worn nail polish to work experiencing workplace discrimination in our survey compared to 16% for guys who have not. So in all three of these experiences, nail polish is playing a significant role. So what is nail polish? Well, nail polish is often something that's seen as uh, feminine, something that's seen as for women and that men are supposed to avoid. So if we think of nail polish as a proxy variable for gender nonconformity, then what would this suggest? Well, if we look at our graphs, perhaps gender nonconforming men are experiencing higher rates of violence and workplace discrimination based on uh, carrying over fingernails to gender nonconformity. So where do we go from here? I would recommend that further research incorporates variables for gender expression, perhaps having multiple options that we can identify, perhaps masculine, feminine, uh, maybe we might identify as queens, and being able to see trends in our data based on gender expression might give us more clarity into how our experiences happen as gay, bi, trans, and queer men. I would also recommend public outreach campaigns that support men exploring our insecurities around gender. One example of this would be how many of us would feel comfortable wearing women's clothes in public? Why might that be difficult for us? What does that say about our relationship with gender? And finally, I would recommend services for gender nonconforming men, and that would be uh, acknowledging that not all of us are bears and lumberjacks, but there's a whole spectrum of us out there which carries on from what David was talking about. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now we're going to hear from investigator Keith Reynolds. Thanks, Olivier. Um, so I wanted to look at um, uh, something that's sort of oh, oh uh, it's a, something that's thrown around a little <coughs> bit uh, in our community, um, and it's the discussion or it's the the lamentation that um, intergenerational um, or that gay guys. Uh, don't communicate intergenerationally, and that there are different, uh, distinct, you know, outcomes associated to these two or to different generations, um, and I don't think that enough time has been um, spent exploring these. Um, uh, uh, people from the older generation might uh, lament kids these days, um, you know, not really taking part uh, or being complacent in um, the gay community, um, whereas younger kids. They don't really recognize old gay men, right? Um, somewhat invisible. Um, so I wanted to take a look at this uh, from a more uh, uh, academic perspective and not just an anecdotal uh, speculation. Um, so, okay, so the the people that I looked at, uh, I looked at um, gay guys, gay and bisexual guys under 30 and over 30, um, and I wanted to know what they wanted. What were the differences between how their what their mindset is. Um, and as you can see, 43% um, of guys under 30 uh, were interested in dating, uh, compared to only 16% of older gay guys. Um, and that's, that's pretty significant to me, anyway, um, because it, it really shows that there's a, a, a huge discrepancy in how people want to shape their lives. Um, 
Uh, younger gay guys tended to want sex with just one partner, their primary partner, um, and older gay guys had a little bit more. Um, they they wanted to have uh, sex with their partner and you know a little bit on the side. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, pretty consistent uh, between sex buddies and group sex. Everybody likes um, that apparently. Um, so when they're having sex, what kind of sex are they into? What kind, like um, uh, so these, uh, the question was, during your last sexual encounter, which of these activities um, occurred? Uh, so 73% of guys said that masturbation was uh, something that they did, compared to only 57%. Um, oral, um, everybody's blowing each other, apparently. Um, and, you know, anal, anal sex, um, younger guys tended to have a little bit higher prevalence of that. So... Um, and while that's all fun, fun and nice to look at, I wanted to look at uh, a few more um, serious implications of how, how gay guys' identities uh, have shaped their um, experiences. Uh, so uh, the under 30 cohort um, report more bullying before the age of 18. So this is um, uh, nothing new. Uh, we all see it played out in the news these days. It's, it's been a pretty dramatic um, uh, topic. Uh, they also experience more verbal violence, uh, about the same amount of physical violence, um, and higher rates of suicidality. Um, but it's not all bleak. Um, younger gay guys uh, tends to have higher uh, rates of support. They feel that they can go to uh, their families at higher rates, uh, their gay friends, especially their straight friends. I thought that was a really striking um, number, 69% said that they could go to straight friends to talk about, or to, to, for support, um, compared to only 40% of older gay guys. So it's a huge difference. Um, and uh, also, 27% uh, said that they didn't have any, 27% of people 30 and over said that they didn't have anybody for support, which is um, a real failing of, of our system. And I'll, talk about more of that later. Um, the biggest thing that I found when I was doing my analysis was that 34% of gay guys uh, under the age of 30 had come out by the time they were 18, uh, compared to only 9% of gay guys who are over 30. Um, so gay guys are coming out younger and younger, and we aren't really, well, I'm not really sure um, what this means, what long-term effects this might have on them. Um, I think it really speaks to the societal attitudes that are that are emerging. Um, you know, positive portrayals of gays in the media, um, uh, marriage equality, and less stigma, less stigma around um, HIV and AIDS. But what effects does coming out uh, earlier have? Um, so this is uh, uh, guys under 30. These numbers are from guys under 30, um, comparing those that aren't that weren't out before 18 and those that are out uh, before 18. Uh, so, right off the top, 72% um, of guys who come out before they're 18 have had sex or have had sex with uh, another man before the age of 18, uh, compared to only 37% of those who are still closeted. Um, and they also experience higher rates of bullying. While it's fairly high between both of them. Um, the odds ratio is 2.4, which is still, it's, it's quite striking. Um, they experience more bullying, or sorry, more uh, verbal violence and physical violence, and as a result, um, have higher suicidality um, and more prescribed medication for depression and anxiety. Um, but again, it's not all bad news. Um, coming out definitely has an impact on um, rates of support. Again. Uh, guys who come out before 18 are, uh, are much more likely to have uh, multiple forms of support available to them. Um, they're able to uh, live their lives authentically and discuss uh, the problems that they face with their family, with their friends, again, especially with their straight friends who unfortunately outnumber their gay friends, um, in, but there it is. Um, and the, the no one, I think, is, is a really heartening thing. Only 6% say that they have no one that they can talk to, um, compared to the closeted, uh, closeted people who said that 22% um, 
systems. So in terms of creating a robust system of support networks, I really think that this is an important um, development. I think it's heartening. Um, so just briefly to sum up, uh, um, guys over 30 uh, who tended to have less robust support systems, uh, they may be vulnerable um, when, some of, when sudden changes cause those support systems to be in jeopardy. Um, I think that more analysis can be done uh, from an intersectional perspective on ageism and homophobia. Um, something, that's something that I'd like to explore next, I think. Um, coming out earlier was not, in my study, a significant indicator of UAI or substance abuse, which is sort of the, the gold standard for finding things wrong with people um, in academic terms, I guess. Um, bullying is pervasive um, throughout all samples, um, but uh, it's especially bad uh, when a person comes out uh, because they make themselves a target. Uh, and the last point I think is, is a really important one is that while uh, diverse support is important, uh, that's sort of a reaction, a reactionary um, method of, of helping people uh, when in fact we should be protecting um, people outright uh, with uh, better policies, education, understanding and community so that they aren't bullied in the first place and they don't need to test those support systems. Now we will hear from investigator Jordan Sang. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Jordan and I'll be talking about relationship status and health. So my interest in why I chose this topic, um, let's be honest, being single can sometimes suck. Uh, this is my own personal opinion. I know some <laughs> friends who disagree with me. Um, but anyways, I wanted to understand the relationship of being in no relationship. And I wanted to compare the health outcomes to the men that were in relationships. Um, my hypothesis is, is that single men will have more mental and physical health inequities than men in relationships. So looking at the data that I used, um, I got this data from the Sex Now 2011 survey. I only looked at gay men in my study. Um, they were the majority of the respondents in the study. Um, I used the single partner with a man and partner with women. The others category consisted of divorced or widowed or other relationship status. But I did not include this study or these groups in my study. So first I wanted to look at mental health and relationships. Um, before I go explain that, I'll explain my table first. Um, the dark pink represents the variable, which is the first one, suicidal thought. Um, below that I have my relationship status. In the middle is percentages. And in the last column is the odds ratio and my 95% confidence interval. Um, I use partnered with women as my reference group, so I compared them to the other statuses, which is partnered with a man and being single. So looking at suicidal thought first, um, what's striking here is that being single has almost a double percentage rate than being partnered with a woman, with it 16% and being single, which is 31%. Um, we can also see that there's incremental increases here, so it gets smaller and then increases in size. Uh, the next variable I looked at was being lonely more than 25% of the time. We can see here that the numbers are roughly the same for being partnered with a man and being partnered with women. And the highest rate is, of course, for being single, which is almost double the previous relationship statuses. Um, this isn't that surprising because if you're partnered with a man or woman, you're more likely to not be lonely. But if you're single, I guess you're more likely to feel like you're lonely. Um, <laughs> Uh, the next variable I used was being sad more than 25% of the time. Um, what we see here is that there's a large difference between being single on the other two variables. Partnered with a woman, there's about um, a 12% increase difference, and being partnered with a man, there's about 8% difference. I wanted to continue on with my study on mental health, so I looked at a few more variables. Um, the first one I looked at was depression in the last 12 months. We can see here that the largest rates are for being single and that the smallest rates are being partnered with women and these rates are incremental. Um, for anxiety, we can see that the highest rates of anxiety are for being partnered with a man and um, the lowest rates are being partnered with a woman. My hypothesis on that is that being partnered with a man is kind of a lot of work to try to always impress your partner or boyfriend, so maybe that's why they feel more anxious more of the time. 
And being single, you don't have to press anyone or worry about looking good or anything. So <laughs> that's why they have lower rates of anxiety. Uh, the next variable I looked at was suicide attempts in the last 12 months. Um, even though these are small numbers, uh, what's interesting here is that the rates are incremental and also that the largest rates are for being single and they're almost double or they're more than double the rates for being partnered with a woman. My next focus, I wanted to look at drugs and relationships. So the first variable I used was party drugs, which included GHB, ecstasy, cocaine and MDMA. Um, what we see here is that there's a small increase between single men and partnered with a man. And however, there's a very large difference between being single and being partnered with a woman. Partnered with a woman only has 7% usage of using party drugs. Looking at smoking, we can see that the rates for being partnered with a man and partnered with a woman are roughly the same. However, when you look at being single, there's a large increase for smoking. Uh, the next variable I used was frequent binge drinking. Um, these numbers I found were roughly the same. However, being single is still the highest rate. So my next focus, I wanted to look at sexual health and relationships. The first variable, variable I looked at was any UAI, which is unprotected anal intercourse with unknown or opposite status partner. Um, it's not surprising that the lowest rates are for being partnered with a woman. But if you're looking at partner with a man and single, there's an increase in the difference. There's a difference there, and that's noteworthy. Um, looking at testing for STI and HIV, the numbers for being partnered with a man and, part and being single are roughly the same for both of them. And of course, the lowest numbers are for being partnered with a woman. Um, even though it may seem good that, 53, that the numbers are roughly the same for being partnered and being single, um, it's noteworthy that the number is only 53%. So only 53% of men are testing for HIV and STI. Uh, the last focus I wanted to look at was support systems and relationships. So um, what I found here was that there's very large percentages and odds ratios here. And this can be because of the um, nature of our participants. My hypothesis is that maybe the partner with a women are not out yet, so that's why they have lower rates of social support. Um, but looking at support from family, we can see that only 5% of gay men partnered with women have support from their family. About 60% of partnered with men have support from their family. And 37% of single men have support from their family. Looking at support from friends, these numbers all increased. Um, and I'm looking at single men, so you can see that the rates for support for being from family and friends are almost doubled, which is noteworthy because it just shows the importance of support of friends. Um, I wanted to look at no support at all, and we can see that about 56% of gay men partnered with women have no support, and only or about 22% of single men have no support. And while this wasn't what I originally was looking for in my study, I wasn't focusing on being gay and partnered with a woman, I did find that through these um, studies that it shows the importance of social supports for gay men partnered with women. So my conclusions. Um, single men are more likely to be sad, depressed, lonely, and suicidal. Um, that's not that surprising to me. I don't know if everyone else has opinions. <laughs> um, drug use and smoking increases for being single. And there's a lack of support systems for single men, and especially gay men partnered with women. Uh, the rates for HIV and STI testing are roughly the same. However, single men are more likely to engage in risky sexual behavior, like UAI. So that is concerning. Um, however, it's not all bad news for single men. In some cases, single men have similar health outcomes to men part in relationships. Um, my study just shows the highlights of the importance of the social determinants of health on gay men. Uh, we can see the effect that relationship status has on health and also the need for improving the determinants of health, like social support to build mental health, education on testing for HIV and STI, and for drugs and alcohol. And that includes my slide <laughs> presentation. Now we're going to hear from investigator uh, Joshin Dulay.
Thank you, Olivier. So my thing was on how does a gay man's view of his body affect his mental health? And uh, so I thought, what better way to discuss body image in gay men than to have body images in gay men's bodies? So on the left is Australian Olympic gold medal diver Matthew Mitchum, and on the right is actor Matt Bomer from the TV series White Collar, or you might recognize him from Magic Mike if you saw that movie this year. So I was interested in looking at mental health and uh, of gay guys, and I chose a specific issue of body image because that's something that I talk about a lot with my friends and acquaintances. And so you'll notice that in a lot of my analyses, I'm comparing gay men with bisexual and straight men who answered the survey. And so there were three questions on the Sex Now survey that looked at body perception. Um, the first is, how have you been in the last 12 months? I am satisfied with how my body looks. And about 43% of gay men answered no, they were not satisfied with their body, whereas 57% answered yes, that they were. In comparison, 50% of straight men and bisexual men were satisfied with their bodies, but the other 50% uh, were uh, happy with their bodies. So you'll notice that about half of the guys who in each of the categories are not satisfied with their body. And the second one I, question I was looking at was, how have you been in the last 12 months? I should be losing weight. And 39% of gay men didn't think they should be losing weight, but 61% thought that they did. And uh, when looking at bisexual and uh, straight men, you'll notice slightly more felt like they should at 66%. And the final question I looked at was whether or not guy, uh, guys wish they were more muscular. And about 78% uh, of gay men wish they were, and only, uh, whereas only 71% of straight men wish, and bisexual men wish that they were muscular. Um, so for the first two questions, um, even though the higher percentage of straight and bisexual men appear to be more dissatisfied with their bodies, uh, the difference between the groups weren't that significant enough to conclude that bisexual or straight men are more unhappy about their bodies than gay men. But with the last question, the difference was significant. Um, but when we start comparing the differences in mental health between the two groups, uh, there are more striking uh, differences that emerge. And so the first health measure I looked at was depression. And so this table might be kind of confusing, so I'm just going to go through it with you. So on the far left column are the questions from the previous slide. Um, in the first row and first column, I'm looking at guys who have been unsatisfied with their body in the last 12 months. And the percentages in that first row show the rates of depression for guys who are unsatisfied with their body. So 12% of gay men uh, are not satisfied with their body, whereas only 7% of straight and bisexual men are not satisfied. But they're, I mean, are not satisfied and they're depressed. So in the second row, gay men who felt like they should be losing weight had a depression rate of 19%, and uh, bisexual and straight men who answered the same way only had a depression rate of 12%. And finally, gay guys who wanted to be more muscular, 18% were depressed, whereas only 12% uh, of straight and bisexual guys who wanted to be more muscular were depressed. So this table shows that in, com in comparison to bisexual and straight men, gay men who are unsatisfied with their bodies tend to have uh, significantly higher rates of depression, even though the previous slides show that the rates were fairly comparable. The next measure I wanted to look at was anxiety. And as you can see here, once again, gay men um, have, uh, once again, uh, you see, have more anxiety than straight and bisexual men who also feel negatively about their bodies. Uh, and the last mental health measure I looked at was suicidal thoughts. And once again, you can see that there are significantly a higher percentage of gay men who had suicidal thoughts in comparison uh, to straight and bisexual men. So I was beginning to wonder what kind of, uh, uh, what kind of reasons for why might, might this be? Like, why are there different um, higher mental health outcomes in comparison to straight and bisexual men and gay guys? And I came up with two different possible reasons why this could be. Um, so the first idea I had was maybe that uh, the way men, uh, more specifically gay men, were portrayed in media uh, might affect the way they perceive their own bodies. So I looked at uh, internet usage to see if something, if coming in contact with pictures of gay men and with their bodies, like the ones I showed you in the beginning of the pictures, uh, may influence the way uh, they perceive their own bodies. So I looked at those who said yes to using the internet to read gay news in the last 12 months because most websites featuring gay news often have advertisements with scantily clad men with bulging biceps and washboard abs. And I looked at guys who use the internet to watch porn for the same reason because most porn features actors who are physically fit and like attractive. And I used sites like Squirt and Manhunt 
uh, guys who answer that they use those sites regularly or frequently because, again, most of the models on those sites uh, are fairly attractive. And after running the analyses, I found that uh, most of the results were not significant. So I decided to test out a different theory, um, which was looking at discrimination to see if this ha somehow could affect um, the, uh, the role gay men have in like having higher rates of depression, anxiety, and suicidal thoughts. Um, so I looked at acceptance of those who felt like the people in the, air, the area that they were living in were accepting of gay men. Um, exclusion, those who felt excluded from the activities that they were participating in the last 12 months based on their sexual orientation. Those who were singled out as being a homo, faggot, or queer. Um, and those who experienced cyberbullying or email harassment within the last 12 months. And once again, I wasn't able to find any sort of significant difference. So we may not know why gay men with negative body images have worse mental health outcomes, but another analysis, um, I did find something that I believe is somewhat optimistic. And I decided to look at um, those who were unsatisfied with their bodies and how they were accessing mental health services. And as you can see here, more gay men who are unsatisfied with their bodies are visiting mental health professionals such as psychiatrists, psychologists, therapists, and counselors. So to conclude, while gay men are unhappy with their bodies and score higher than bisexual and straight men on depression, anxiety, and suicidality, we should keep in mind that the vast majority of men who answered our survey are mentally healthy. And while we may not know what causes this difference between gay men and bisexual and straight men on health measures in these surveys, the bright side is that gay men who do feel more negatively about their bodies are discussing these issues with healthcare providers. Thanks. Now we're going to hear from Daniel McGraw. Daniel. Thanks, Olivier. So as you can see uh, from my fellow investigators, we were given quite a wide berth to pursue our analysis interests wherever they may lie, whatever we had passion for, whatever we have experience with. For some of us, uh, that was a matter of discrimination, gender nonconformity, the impacts of loneliness or relationship status. For me, it was sex and drugs. And I don't just mean sex and drugs like a fun Saturday night. I mean sex and drugs like the, social, the societal narratives surrounding them, the social constructions of them. And for my analysis, I was especially interested in examining the received reflections of sex and drugs within gay culture. For while we now have a competing narrative that you can poach a child from the developing world to nest with in the suburbs, like Cam and Mitchell and Modern Family do, for some of us that are perhaps less domesticated, a weekend uh, of fun, my weekend, could be seen as a, de the depraved impulses of a drug-addicted pervert or that of a fun-loving, sexually liberated, actualized hedonist, whether you were asking, say, Stephen Harper or uh, Spencer Herbert. So depending, it all depends on the perspective that you're viewing this through. I've seen these uh, reflections, these narratives of sex and drugs enacted and contradicted among my gay friends, my gay peers, uh, co-workers, guys that I uh, facilitate in totally outright every year. Each of them fulfills or bucks these narratives in their own ways. And I was interested in seeing with the idea received that gay men have a high number of sexual partners uh, and that drugs are ever present within the community, whether or not that was actually the case and what impacts might that um, have, or as I phrased it, is the gay community one of drug abusing sluts? And if so, how might that impact health outcomes? So first and foremost, uh, I'm specifically up here not slut shaming anyone. I'm not here as some um, dowdy epidemiologist who's wagging his finger at the gay men for having such a high rate of sexual partners. Um, I'm up here as a happily slutty slut with happily slutty slut friends in a community where there are lots of slutty sluts, whether happy or not. And it's not necessarily something that we look down upon. In fact, in some cases, it's something that's valued to have more sexual partners. So this is the language that I'm comfortable with, and thus it's the language that I'm using. As well, I'm not interested here in uh, defining what is and is not a slut, um, what number would qualify one as, but rather looking at the data. In that same way, I say abusing, the difference between abuse and use, again, would depend perhaps if you're an RCMP officer giving a D.A.R.E. presentation or if you're me up here giving this presentation. Uh, as well, up here, I will put the data on the screen and you can interpret that through whatever lens it is that you happen to hold dearest. As well, I feel that it's important to point out that I said gay community. I could have also said gay scene, but because I'm specifically looking at the received reflections within society, 
you know, most people will probably remember Babylon from Queer as Folk rather than some gay community center or organizations. We have to understand that the gay scene is in many cases interpreted to be the gay community. But specifically, I'm not looking here at gay men. I'm not saying, are gay men drug abusing sluts? Because as well, I'm not asking, um, or I wasn't looking at self-identified gay men necessarily, but performatively gay men. And so I didn't take the question, as we saw with um, Trevor's slide, of sexual orientation and use that when I'm uh, using as a reference MSM in future slides, but rather looking at the relationship status. We asked them, are you currently? And so men who are single and gay, single and bi, or partnered, married, separated, or divorced from a man would fall under the gay category, and those who are single and straight or partnered, married, divorced, or separated from a woman would fall under the MSM category. And that's a performative idea. When I'm here referring to gay and MSM, I'm looking at sexual orientation performativity rather than identification. So, what makes someone a slut? Uh, I ran the numbers at several different levels be just because it is rather arbitrary and we all have a different idea of what qualifies someone as having had a high number of sexual partners. If we considered having fucked six guys over the course of the previous 12 months to be a slutty person, then that would be 50% of the sample. If we bumped it up to 12 partners over the course of the last year, that would be about a third of the sample, 31%. And if we bumped it up to 30 or more partners over the course of the year, that would be 13% of the sample. Um, I feel also it's important to note here, I uh, did a little bit of side research to see what a general population survey says about number of sexual partners over the course of a lifetime, and they went from more lowball answers and averages of four or six people over the course of a lifetime to 12 and 14. So to say that 50% of the population of the sample over the course of two years would have fucked more people than many people will over the course of their entire life, I'll leave that to you uh, to decide whether or not that is slutty or not. <laughs> As well, uh, I included here at the bottom as a reference um, the incidence of unprotected anal intercourse with unknown or opposite Sarah status partner, uh, which was at 33% over the sample of gay men. This is looking at the gay men rather than the sample as a whole. Um, the comparable percentage for the category that I qualify as MSM would be 22%. So how do we compare to that group of MSM? As we can see, gay men at every level uh, are sluttier by percentage and sluttier by magnitude. And so um, the percentage of gay men who are having sex with 6, 12, or 30 is higher, and the relative gap between those numbers increases with each level. Uh, for my purposes, I decided that fucking 12 partners over the course of the year was the comfortable seat of my analysis. Uh, I felt that having one sexual partner a month averaged over a year was certainly a reasonable number, while at the same time perhaps more than the average person would have over the course of their life. So... Using that variable, um, here we can see uh, among gay and MSM, those guys who have had more sexual partners, who I may from here on refer to as the sluttier group of guys in the sample, uh, have a much higher rate of unprotected anal intercourse than those guys who are less slutty. Uh, in fact, double in, uh, in the case of gay and MSM uh, and the sample as a whole. Um, when we look at uh, gay men only, a reassuring habit uh, comes up when uh, looking at testing. And so for those guys who have had a higher number of sexual partners, they're also testing at a higher rate. 66% of them will uh, have had an HIV test over the past year as compared to the less slutty category where it's only 50%. Additionally, for those guys who are engaging in unprotected anal intercourse, they uh, are testing at a rate of about 60% over the course of the year as opposed to 51% for those guys who said they had not engaged in UAI over the previous year. And while it remains true for the less slutty group, that unprotected anal intercourse will increase the rate of testing, for that group who are sluttier, who have had more sexual partners over the course of the year, it actually doesn't have any impact on the rate of their testing, and in fact, is a slightly lower percentage for those guys who have had UAI than those guys who have not engaged in UAI over the course of the previous year. So what I do from this is that, while being sluttier perhaps, would um, influence the rate at which you got tested, the virtue of that sluttiness would not necessarily. How about drugs? As we can see here, uh, gay men in this category also are using drugs at a higher rate than the MSM category, 18% to 8%, 15% over the course of the uh, entire sample. Um, I would like to point out as well, though, that this is problematized by age, as we can clearly see young gay guys and young MSM, whether or not uh, they use party drugs at an equal rate, as opposed to older guys, where older MSM are using party drugs at a much lower rate. Party drugs here refers to cocaine, G, um, MDMA, ketamine, and meth. Um, and so as we can see here, gay men uh, 
over 30 are using at a rate much higher than the MSM category over 30. And this is really understandable. When you imagine that uh, a group of bears passing around a baggy and key on the floor of Rapture on Pride Sunday and realize that there's no equivalent acceptable area of drug use for straight men um, who are over a certain age. But uh, I was, again, as I've said, I'm not particularly interested in someone's use or abuse of these substances, more so than possible risk associated with them. And so starting with that gold standard of gay male risk behaviors on protected anal intercourse, we see that it's significantly higher for guys who are using party drugs over those guys who are not using party drugs, 52% to 29%. As well, suicidality is much higher among that uh, double, among that group who are using party drugs over those who are not using party drugs. And as well, we can see that those guys who are using party drugs are a little bit, slu or rather a bit sluttier, having a, uh, more of them having a, fucked more than 12 guys over the course of the previous year. From this, of course, the question would then be, what about those guys who are both fucking more than 12 guys over the course of the year and using party drugs? And so, when we look at unprotected anal intercourse for those guys who are fucking fewer than 12 partners over the course of the year, uh, they, if they have, had, have not been using party drugs, they have a lower rate of UAI. If they have been using party drugs, they have a higher rate of UAI, higher and lower than the sample average. But if we look at those guys who are fucking more than 12 guys over the course of the year, even if they haven't used party drugs over the past year, still 47% of them will have engaged in UAI, which is 15 percentage points higher than the sample average. But if they have fucked 12 guys and used party drugs, then fully 70% of them will have engaged in UAI over the course of the previous year. That 70% is more than triple the rate of the MSM of the sample, double the sample average, and 50% higher than those guys only fucking 12 guys, but not using party drugs as well. That's, uh, here you see an odds ratio of 2.77, comparing those guys who do and don't use party drugs, when comparing those guys who are less slutty and not using party drugs to those guys who are sluttier and using party drugs, the odds ratio is 8.44. So, what are some conclusions that we can draw from this? Uh, the purpose of this presentation, as I understood it, was to provide a snapshot of our analysis rather than to come to any conclusions. And so I don't find any of this particularly conclusive, and I draw from it no conclusions. Uh, from my analysis, I'd hope to gain a better picture of the associated risks for guys like me and around me who I love. Um, I went into this analysis actually wondering if I could buck the idea that guys who are slutty and do drugs, because I'm one of them, uh, have all of these negatively associated ink, uh, outcomes attached to that. Uh, and so while I'm not necessarily surprised that these received ideas uh, about the gay community are in fact in some way or to some degree possibly correct, um, I don't think that these numbers actually are particularly meaningful outside of investigation as to why. Without qualitative um, research into why this is, these numbers are essentially useless. But. To my original post question, are we a community of drug abusing sluts? Clearly, we enjoy our bodies and we enjoy our substances, and this pleasure is not without associated risks. Thanks. Uh, now we're going to hear from our last investigator, but not the least, David Lee. Thank you, Olivier. Um, so, hi, everyone. Um, I'm David. Uh, so, uh, my presentation is going to be on gay men and social support. Um, so, in thinking about what I wanted to look at in the Sex Now survey, I really wanted to take an assets-based approach and focus on something positive, something that we could be proud of, something meaningful, not only statistically, but personally as well. Um, and after a bit of searching, I found myself with social support. Um, so, social support can take on many different forms, such as the support of a close friend, the support of family, whether biological or chosen, the support of a community. However it manifests, having social support is something that we can all understand and appreciate as a place of growth, as a place of friendship and camaraderie, and as a place of acceptance and belonging. Its importance is recognized by the Public Health Agency of Canada and is listed as a key determinant of health, citing evidence that social contacts, social support, and emotional support relate to lower premature death rates and mortality. Given this information, the question that I settled on was how does social support relate to men in the Sex Now survey? In the Sex Now survey, I used the question that you see here as my measure of social support. Who can you count on or talk to for support? 
So men who filled out the survey could um, indicate whether or not they had the support of gay friends, family, straight friends, a partner, or a professional, with the examples uh, listed for professionals such as doctor, advocate, and counselor. So also note here that the way that the question is phrased um, also indicates that the support has a certain degree of quality as well, because um, it's a support that you can count on. It's a person that you could talk to. So when we looked at these sources of social support, we see that gay men were the most likely to report having at least one group that they could count on for support at almost 90%. Um, and for bisexual and straight men, these rates were much lower. When we separated the social support into different groups, what we can see uh, first is that gay men are the highest source of social support among gay men, but also surprisingly among bisexual and straight men as well. What we can also see is that um, for the group of gay men, they also tend to report having the support of, um, sorry, having more support from all five groups compared to bisexual and straight men. Even when we look at it across the different age groups, what we can see is that gay, gay men remain a central, uh, uh, sorry, gay men remain a central source of support um, for uh, the men in our survey, um, with the topmost bar indicating the support of gay men. So knowing this, I went on to look at the benefits that these social support networks had. Um, so just a quick explanation. Um, so my comparisons looked at um, how the, the differences between the presence or absence of five, the five different social support groups. Um, so here I looked at how social support related to health behaviors. So having social support uh, was related to um, a greater percentage of men uh, reporting that they tested for STIs. Um, now, what's interesting here is that we see, with respect to the support of professionals, we see the highest percentage um, of men reporting that they tested for STIs in the last 12 months if they had the support of a professional. Um, also interesting to note is that among the non-professional sources of support, um, having the support of gay friends was also um, related to an increased likelihood of uh, testing for STIs. Very similar findings were found in relation to support and HIV testing in the last 12 months as well. So we see here again, um, professionals, um, having the support of a professional was related um, to having a higher percentage of men reporting that they had tested for HIV in the last 12 months. And once again, we see that the support of gay friends um, uh, comes in highest among the non-professional sources of social support. I also looked at health support related to those who access medical services in the last 12 months. Here, uh, what's striking is that um, the support of professionals uh, has a much stronger relationship um, in relation to accessing medical care in the past 12 months, which is not surprising. Um, and once again, we see gay friends um, coming in uh, second with respect to the non-professional sources of social support. Um, but these positive influences of social support also extended beyond promoting health-seeking behaviors, which brings me to happiness. Um, support and how it relates to more subjective experiences. So as we can see here, the highest percentage of happy guys are those uh, who report having the support um, of a partner, which is not surprising. Um, but also interesting to note is that the greatest percentage difference between the yes and no columns occurs with gay friends. So uh, what I would uh, hypothesize uh, would be that there's something particular about having um, the support of gay friends um, that's important in, um, in our happiness. Uh, with respect to body satisfaction, uh, we see once again um, that having partners, uh, having a supportive partner is related to um, in, uh, increased amount of men reporting that they are satisfied with their bodies. Um, and also surprisingly, we see that gay friends comes in second with respect to body satisfaction. Okay, perfect. Um, which brings me to the creme de la creme of support, um, how it relates to feelings of acceptance. So in particular, it's the feeling that gay and bi men are accepted within one's respective communities. Here, uh, what's important to note is that all the types of the support have a role to play with respect to feelings of acceptance. And in fact, 
the more support men had, the more likely they were to feel accepted. With those men reporting all five types of social support, um, reporting um, having the greatest number of men reporting that they felt accepted. Um, so, some takeaway messages from my presentation. Um, having the support of professional appears to be uh, important uh, with respect to um, health promoting behaviors such as testing and in particular accessing medical care. Um, <laughs> the support of our wonderful partners uh, is related to our um, happiness and about our body satisfaction. Um, but most importantly, what I want to um, uh, emphasize is that across the board, um, gay friends remain um, an important source um, of support for promoting our health behaviors and also uh, in our more subjective experiences of happiness and feelings of acceptance. But what does this look like in our day-to-day -day lives? Social support is something that's very tangible and meaningful um, to all of us in our day-to-day -day lives. They're the people we go to when we need a helping hand, when we want to feel like a million bucks, <laughs> and where we can be ourselves. Thank you.